Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. This is Hossam Sadek from Transit. Um, uh, welcome to the 2020 Transit Conference. Uh, this time we are uh, holding it virtually. So we'll have our uh, session 3B, Asphalt Concrete Materials, this afternoon. And we will have um, uh, four, prod four presentations uh, to be uh, presented. We'll start with the uh, first uh, project from LSU. Um, I need just to remind uh, everyone here that if you need to collect your professional development uh, hours, you can uh, visit our website, the conference website, and there is a form you can complete and send it to us uh, in order to give you a certificate for the hours you uh, attended here in the conference. Uh, in addition, there is uh, a list of uh, three minutes this presentation recorded the presentations by our students, transit students. Uh, also, you can see these links in the um, program uh, page of the conference. Uh, we'll start with the first presentation. Shirara, can you hear me? Yes. So you have uh, up to 12 minutes of presentation, and then we'll go for questions and answers. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Shirara Shirzad. And this project is about a laboratory investigation of um, asphalt mixture modified using a self-healing polyurethane pre-polymer. Uh, okay. So as you uh, may know, more, more than 90% of the roads around the World in United States or in Europe are surfaced with asphalt pavement. This is mostly because of asphalt pavement advantage, such as easy installation, easy repair, uh, right quality, but because of different parameters, uh, such as poor um, construction, poor quality material, or for example, climate condition, different type of distresses appear in asphalt pavement. Uh, one of the most common type of distresses is cracking. Cracking also can happen because of different reasons. It can be because of, uh, like again, poor uh, design or poor construction or poor, poor, poor um, material quality. But it also happens uh, because of aging, an aging of asphalt binder. It also uh, happens when we use recycled asphalt material when we use aged asphalt binder in the construction of new pavement. So when we use wrap and rest in the construction of new pavement, we expect to see cracking earlier in the service life of asphalt pavement. And that's something that a lot of research is going on to address this issue. So we can increase the amount of wrap and rest in the construction of new pavements. And another type of uh, distress that we usually see in pavement Asphalt pavement is rotting, which is the accumulation of permanent deformation under the wheel path. Uh, so like I said, there is a lot of research going on in asphalt pavement industry, uh, trying or working on different type of additives to address these issues to improve durability of asphalt pavement and increase service life of the pavement. This research is also about the type of additive we use to improve durability, durability of the asphalt pavement. Uh, so one, of, one example of additives used in asphalt industry is uh, polymer. Polymers are used to improve rotting resistance, thermal cracking resistance, fatigue cracking resistance, improve elastic recovery and ductility. However, sometimes polymers are expensive. Uh, in some cases, they show low compatibility with asphalt binder and they also may have low aging resistance. But the polymer is like polymer additive is widely used in asphalt pavement construction. Uh, on the other hand, asphalt uh, has self-healing properties, which means that it has the capability to heal cracks by itself over time and recover original properties, its original properties. So self-filling of asphalt binder uh, happens because of wetting and interdiffusion of two phases of the crack, and it happens at the molecular level. However, the self-healing rate of asphalt pavement is highly dependent on temperature, loading rate, and crack width. So uh, at ambient temperature and under continuous traffic load, 
we have a very low crack healing rate in asphalt pavement. For this study, we used a polymer, which is called, it's a new generation of polymer. Uh, it's called UV light activated self healing polymer and uh, oxidant substituted cutosone polyurethane. So what's uh, going on with this polymer is that it's combining two functionality in one material. This polymer can improve self healing rate of asphalt binder and at the same time it has the properties of a polymer so it can improve mechanical properties of asphalt pavement. So for the self healing functionality uh, it, uh, it is intrinsic approach, it happens at a molecular level, it is repeatable, so it can cure cracks or heal cracks at the same location again and again, and the self-healing process is activated by UV light. Sunlight is a cheap, clean uh, source of UV light and it's available. Um, and then for the polymer modification functionality, we're expecting that this self-healing polymer uh, be able to improve. It was expected that this polymer improve rotting resistance of asphalt pavement and also improve its cracking performance. Uh, so what's going to happen is when we have this material present in our asphalt mixture and micro crack appears in our sample, uh, chemical bonds in the self-healing polymer are broken different chemical bonds and free on a, unable, uh, free unstable radicals are produced. And then with UV exposure, we also have scissoring of bonds in ketosan and then these react together. Uh, we're gonna have a material with a new structure, but during this whole process and recombination of the unstable bonds, they get together, recombine and heal cracks. Uh, so this is the process that we were expecting to see. We were expected to see in our material because of the self-healing properties. Uh, this self-healing polymer has three main components. The first one is ketosan, which is uh, the most abundant natural polymer. It's biodegradable, biocompatible. It has polyfunctionality and it provides UV sensitivity, sensitivity which is required for the self-healing in this material. Then we have oxyton, which is a covalently attached four-member ring. And when we have when we have micro cracks in our material, the actually the ring, this ring is broken, and then it provides free radicals, which are uh, really unstable. And then we have the backbone of this material, which is a polymer. It's polyurethane. Um, polyurethane is a you can produce polyurethane by reacting NCO group with a material that has OH group and then produce urethane, right? So we have a, a type of diazocyanate, we have a type of polyol, and then when we react these two materials together, we have polyurethane. But the good thing about this polymer that we are using in this, uh, this uh, study is that we can react it with asphalt binder because asphalt binder has OH group present in it. So if we react diazocyanate and polyol in the presence of asphalt binder, we actually get a three-dimensional network of polymer, self-healing properties, and asphalt binder. And uh, we can improve engineering properties. At the same time, eliminate issues with the phase separation. Uh, OK, so this is a picture of the sample we prepared in our lab. But this is when we completely cured the sample, uh, the polymer, self-healing polymer. But we previously did cure the material completely and then mix it with asphalt binder. But in that case, we had some phase separation issues and then, then we decided to use a pre-polymer instead of a completely cured polymer. Uh, so if I just wanna go through the production process really fast, we have, during the first step, we have to react ketosan with oxyton to produce oxyton substituted ketosan. And in the second step, instead of curing the polymer, we disperse oxyton substituted ketosan in asphalt binder for 30 minutes at a low temperature compared to like mixing temperature, which we usually use 163. Here we use 110 degrees C. And then we, in a separate container, we react HDI with PEG under nitrogen for 10 minutes at room temperature. And then we mix these two together. 
and let the polymer cure inside the asphalt binder. We mix them for 45 minutes at 110 degrees C and using an RPM of 1500. In this case, we're going to get a three-dimensional network before, between all the components that we use and eliminate issues with phase separation. Uh, so for this project, we prepared four different mixtures. The first one we used, the PG67-22. The first sample was controlled without any self-healing pre-polymer. For the three uh, other mixture, we used 5%, 10%, and 15% uh, self-healing pre-polymer. The first test that we conduct, we prepared a slabs. So we prepared modified uh, binder. Then compacted the slabs, cut the slabs into beams, use the three-point three bending setup to create crack under the sample, and use the light microscope to take pictures from the uh, cracks, and then just uh, expose our sample to UV light and no UV light. In the, under these two conditions, we monitor the crack healing rate and calculated the crack healing percentage as crack width at day zero minus crack width at day seven or day 15 divided by crack width at day zero. Other than self-healing tests, we conducted some mechanical testing. We evaluated cracking at intermediate temperature using semicircular bending and rotting using LWT. And then we extracted binder and conducted MSCR and LAS. Sherera, you have two minutes left. Yes, I'm gonna. Okay, so the first set of results is from uh, self-healing, and you can see that with increase in the self-healing polymer, we saw an increase in crack healing up to 10%, and then we have a decrease in the crack healing rate. And also we see an improvement with uh, changing the conditioning from room temperature to UV exposure. So it shows that UV exposure activated the self-healing process. Here we have a space uh, diagram for rotting and cracking. Uh, you can see that the control fade failed at both rotting and cracking. However, mixture with 5% self-healing polymer uh, showed acceptable performance both for rotting and cracking. Uh, for 10 and 15%, we have a JC value. So we have acceptable rotting, but JC value is better than uh, control, but it is still uh, is lower than 0 0.5. Uh, so here we have the result from LWT and MSCR and then SCB and last. Uh, we did what we did, we compared these results together and here you show, you can see the correlation between uh, LWT and then JNR. Uh, so we have RUPTEP and JNR and you can see when we have all four samples, we have a R score of 0.9663. But when we remove this uh, control, we have R square 0.996, which shows that we have a good correlation between our samples when we remove control, which doesn't have polymer in it. So that makes sense. The same result was observed when we have the result from LAS and JC value. So for my conclusion, I just want to mention that we were able to produce this material in our lab, successfully prepare the modified asphalt binder, we saw improvement in self-healing when we added 10% self-healing polymer and exposed materials samples to UV exposure. But higher than that, we saw loss of strength and cohesion between the aggregate and binder. We saw improvement in cracking with 5% self-healing polymer. And we saw improvement in rotting resistance with increase in the self-healing polymer, which shows increase in the stiffness with the increase in the percentage of self-healing polymer. Uh, we observe increase in percentage recovery and decrease in JNR and uh, improved fatigue behavior with uh, re result we obtained from LAS. Uh, thank you for uh, listening to my presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Sherera, for the presentation. Very interesting work. So any questions from the attendees? We have almost 83 people attending this uh, presentation. Any question? So
So there is a question. Uh, how did you set temperature of 110 C and RPM for mixing of asphalt binder with self-healing additive? Uh, so we just use a hot plate and then digital temperature controller to use the temperature of uh, 110 degrees C and then set the RPM to mm -hmm. whatever we want it, yes. Thank you. Any other question from the attendees? Yes, I have a question, Ustam, if I may. Sure. Um, how yes, sure. deep do you think this healing process can happen? Because, you know, if you have a crack at the surface, yes, the UV rays may may work and the healing may take place but you may have lots of cracking that is not shown at the surface yet yes so yes that's one of the issues maybe or challenges for this approach so basically the we can use it for top to bottom cracking but maybe for bottom to top cracking uh, it doesn't have the same effect but what we can use it is when we can use it with open graded mixtures and then also we can uh, use it for emulsions or sealants and look to this type of application for this material, which will have a higher exposure to UV light. Or we can like think about other sources of UV exposure and provide the energy that we need uh, with other sources, like other sources than sunlight. But these are the things that, yes, we have to think in the future. And, and you may also want to think about, you know, an asphalt mix will be produced and stay in the silo for two days at high temperature. And um, also you may want to consider long-term aging because, you know, cracking will happen several years after that mix is placed. So yes. uh, do these affect the properties of the material? Uh, so the STB test that we conducted is on the aged sample. So it was aged in, in an oven for uh, five days at 85 degrees C. And then we extracted binder from both uh, aged sample and unaged sample. So these tests were conducted on aged and unaged samples to have a better representation on what's going on with the sample and how self-healing polymer affects performance of the samples after aging too. Thank you very much. Sure.